Welcome to the Commonwealth Home Ownership Podcast, the real estate investing podcast for Canadians. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just getting started, you've come to the right place. If you're looking for a way to take control of your life through real estate investing, stay tuned and be sure to join us at cwho.ca, your hub for all things real estate investing in Canada. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, our special guest for tonight, Michael Fadun of for Final Cut Creations. For those of us who are just joining us, uh, Michael is, has been in the renovation business for the last nine years and help, uh, helping homeowners add value to their homes. And more recently, he has been helping investors specialize, by specializing in uh, secondary legal secondary basement suites. And he'll, he's here to talk to us tonight about how to select a contractor from a contractor's perspective. So Michael, I'll let you take it away. Great, everybody can hear me. Excellent, so, hmm. It says I can control your screen for a little bit. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, as Phil said, I'm here to uh, discuss uh, the topic of how to um, select a contractor for uh, your power team as a uh, real estate investor. Uh, before I get into that, though, I should probably introduce myself. Or maybe it's just delayed. Here we go. Um, so, my name is Michael Fadoon. And uh, I'm a journeyman carpenter, and I've um, been um, running Final Cut Creations now for uh, close to 10 years. And uh, we're a home renovations company. And uh, so everything from kitchens, bathrooms, basements, full house renovations, and, uh, and now more recently specializing in secondary suites. Uh, so basement suites, carriage suites, et cetera. And, uh, and I'm also a real estate investor myself. So um, that being said, well, we're going to cover a few topics here on how to select your contractor. And uh, the first step to doing that is oh, back and forth here. Um, so how to really get started on selecting your contractor is to uh, get recommendations. And uh, to do that, um, uh, word of mouth is really the best way. So uh, you can start off by uh, talking to your realtor. Uh, your realtor will have experience with contractors uh, potentially because they may have um, recommended them to clients that are purchasing homes to do renovations and properties that they're purchasing. Um, you can visit your local lumber yard. Your local lumber yard will have experience with a lot of contractors and they'll see the ones that are coming and going, the ones that are business uh, busy and the ones that, uh, um, uh, you know, are the professionals and the ones that are reliable and coming in a lot and have a good reputation. But really the best way to uh, get a recommendation or a referral for a contractor is uh, to uh, turn to your friends and family. Those are the ones that uh, you know, have done a renovation uh, in their home and have had a, a good experience and feel confident that they can refer to that, refer you to uh, a contractor and will give you um, some good, honest, uh, good, honest advice. Uh, but in that process of looking for a contractor and looking for a referral for a contractor, it's great to look for somebody that um, has some experience, a contractor that has experience uh, working with investors, or even better yet, a contractor that uh, is an investor themselves. The reason I say that is because um, that contractor is going to have a good understanding about uh, what a real estate investor is looking for. And if they're an investor themselves, they'll even have um, potentially a good finger on the pulse as to um, where you where you can uh, in, um, improve on your property and 
the best places to uh, spend your dollars. So if, for example, if you're doing a fix and flip, uh, you want a contractor that's going to give you some good recommendations on where you're gonna get the best value. So should you be spending it in the kitchen? Should you be spending it in the bathroom? Where, where could you um, put your money so that you're gonna get the, the, bet, the make the most profit on that, on that uh, project? Otherwise, if you're finding somebody that doesn't have any experience, it doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that you shouldn't work with that person. However, you might have to do a bit more handholding or educate that contractor on uh, where the areas are, are, are that are important uh, to get the best return or to see the best profit back. And if we're talking about um, a buy and hold, that contractor is going to recommend products or materials that are maybe going to stand up a little bit better as a rental property and know where uh, where to make recommendations in that so that um, you're making the best choices uh, for a rental. So once you've had some referrals and you're hoping that you're going to get a few because you'd like to go through an interview process. Um, so it's going to start off with a, with a phone call and then move into um, uh, a meeting in person. So if you could get a few uh, referrals, um, it's great because then you're going to want to do a phone interview with uh, these contractors and you're going to want to ask some key questions like what type of work does this contractor specialize in? So going back to, do they have any experience with uh, real estate investors? Um, how long have they been in business? I'm probably going to want to work with somebody that's been around for a while and has some experience doing renovations. Now is not the time for you to start to maybe give an opportunity or give a contract, a, a new contractor, the opportunity to uh, test out their skills. Uh, in your real estate investment, it may be a, a time if uh, you were renovating your own bathroom uh, that you might give a, a new contractor a chance. But in a real estate investment, I'd say you're looking for a seasoned contractor that has some experience. Um, and then, uh, what uh, do they do? They work with a contract agreement, so that's going to be really important. You always want to work with a contractor that has a contract agreement. Um, and typically contract agreement will be supplied by the contractor. Um, what type of, what type of uh, payment terms does the contractor work with? There's a different ways that you can pay your contractor. The two typical ways to pay a contractor is either um, cost plus, which means that the um, contractor is going to invoice you based on milestones or completions during the project. And they're gonna invoice you for the labor that was incurred in the materials that were purchased and, and mark up those materials, et cetera. And the other way is to invoice, or sorry, to, um, uh, yeah, so to invoice the project as a, as a quoted project. So the benefit to the quoted project is you know that that's going to be a guaranteed price. Um, so that's the, the method that I like better because um, I want to be able to um, budget and forecast what the project is going to cost, especially in a real estate investment, because I've purchased that property with a budget in mind so that um, it's going to cash flow if I'm doing a Burr method or that it's going to profit when I flip it. So um, that's the positive side to the quoted um, project. Um, and and probably the riskier side on a cost plus um, situation because uh, the contractor is going to invoice you just based on costs incurred and may have only just estimated how much the project is going to be when they get started. Um, so the, the next thing that you wanna ask them is, uh, do they take a deposit? So in Alberta, this is governed, and in order to take a deposit before work has started, they have to have a prepaid contractor's license. This is important because this is what's going to protect you from, say, um, paying a deposit before work has started and then not ever seeing your contractor again. Uh, it's not mandatory. You don't have to have a, a prepaid contractor license. If you don't have a prepaid contractor license, 
you just can't take a deposit. However, uh, you can work on milestones of completion. So that'll be outlined in a contract agreement. So the contractor will get started. They'll have materials on site and they'll start working. They'll, um, they'll send you an invoice for the first milestone. Now um, the, the project is going and they've reached the next milestone. So say framing is done or drywall is completed. They're going to um, issue you another invoice. Um, so you're paying your contractor as work is, is, is done. So you can start seeing progress and you're paying for only the things that are there um, on site and, and completed at the project. And then um, again, I touch on uh, uh, how they worked with real estate investors. I, I think that that's uh, something that we've already discussed. Uh, do they have references? So you're going to want to have to, you're going to want to um, call your contractor's uh, references. Uh, for me personally, um, I send my clients about a list of 20 references. You don't have to call all 20. Um, I, I usually say, uh, feel free to call all 20, but call three if you want. Uh, uh, but it's great to be able to have the uh, ability to, to say that, uh, you know, I have uh, 20 clients that are very happy to, to give reference and, uh, you know, feel free to call them and, and, and find out what that experience was like. You want to do your due diligence and, and follow up and call their references. And then what is the, what are the contractor's credentials? So how are they qualified? Are they a journeyman carpenter? Um, what kind of training do they have? What's their background? And what type of uh, relationship uh, do they have with their subtrades? Uh, this would be a key indicator as to uh, what their reputation is like as a contractor. So, if your contractor has a really good relationship with their subtrades, then they'll have been working with those subtrades for an extended period of time. They'll have been they'll have a relationship with their electrician or their plumber for the last, you know, five to ten years. Been working with the same person. If they say, well, you know, I've just been working with this electrician for a year, I would hope that they have a really good reason. Um, because that would be an indicator to me that potentially this contractor, uh, you know, goes through subtrades because he has a, a difficult time building good relationships with them because maybe he doesn't uh, pay them on time or maybe he hasn't paid them at all. And so uh, you want to look for a contractor that has uh, strong relationships with their subtrades. And you don't, you don't really want to have a contractor that's scrambling to find subtrades while he's working on your project. Uh, it's, it's important, and, and, and this is mandatory, they have to have a business license um, for the municipal, uh, municipality that the project is in. So you can have a business license in Calgary, but you can't work in Airdrie or you can't work in Cochrane. You have to have a business license for Cochrane. You have to have a business license for Airdrie and other municipalities, Okotoks example, for another example, other small, smaller towns um, or hamlets may just be governed by the county. So like Rocky View, for example, uh, you don't have to have a business license for those, but for some of the larger towns and cities uh, in and around Calgary, you do have to have a business license. And then um, really important, do they have liability insurance and uh, WCB coverage? You want to make sure your contractor has that uh, in place because if they don't, you're either going to, damage could happen to your home um, and, uh, and it won't be covered and now you're trying to battle and get the money out of them out of court, uh, in court. Uh, so damage to the house will be covered by liability insurance and WCB coverage will cover their employees and potentially even their subtrades if their subtrades don't have WCB coverage on their own. So important that they uh, have WCB coverage and they're up to date on their, on their payments for WCB because if they don't have WCB coverage uh, and uh, a subtrade or a employee of the contractor gets hurt um, at your house, at your uh, project, um, WCB will go to the contractor, and if they can't get the money from the contractor, they're coming after you. So we want to make sure they have uh, WCB coverage. And what associations does this contractor belong to? So, you know, are they members of the Better Business Bureau? Uh, are they members of Bill Green, Renault Mark? These are groups that um, have a screening process for themselves. You can't just um, sign up and now you're 
uh, a member of the Better Business Bureau, they're gonna, they're gonna make sure, and they're checking in on uh, companies like mine. I'm a member of the Better Business Bureau. They make sure that I, I have the licenses for the municipalities that I work in, that I have a contract agreement in place, that I have liability coverage. So they're kind of like a pre-screening for you. Um, and uh, and give that uh, and then also have ratings so so for example uh, better business bureau um, uh, will give anything from an a plus to an f uh, for uh, a rating for for a construction company and uh, that gives you a pretty good indication of what type of business they are so these are some of the questions that you want to ask a contractor um, in your initial phone interview and then um, you determine how they answer those questions um, how important those are to you. Once, you're, uh, once you are done with the uh, phone interviews, uh, you also want to uh, meet them in person. So meeting your contractor in person can happen at a coffee shop or even a potential project that you have uh, in mind. Uh, coffee shop works, uh, project uh, that you have in mind or that you're about to get started is even better because then you can start to ask that contractor some, some specific questions uh, relating to the project that you're gonna be working on, and you can, you can gauge their response and how they communicate a, a lot better. Um, so, and in doing so, and setting up this, uh, this um, meeting in person, you wanna just analyze and, and, and get it, um, and see how, how does this person show up? Uh, in construction, uh, it, it gets messy, it gets dirty. Uh, you know, myself as a carpenter, I'm dusty at the, on the job site. I get covered in sawdust, and and uh, you know, sometimes I'm caught doing some painting, and I get paint on myself. And but when I have a meeting um, with a potential client that day, say at the end of the day, I'm going to go from the job site to to meet with a client, or say I'm even going to go at lunch. Uh, I'm going to have a change of clothes. I don't want to show up um, with my grubby work clothes um, because this is this is important. Um, I take I take this seriously, and I'm a professional, so I put a change of clothes on um, so that I'm much more presentable and uh, and 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 looking professional. And then, um, yeah, so make make sure that the, that person is is uh, is, sh is showing up and, and showing up as a professional, and then and really pay close attention to um, how they answer your questions and uh, do they answer them confidently. In this in-person meeting, uh, you wanna start asking some more specific questions about a, a project that you have in mind. And even though you might know the answers, I think it's a good idea to still ask the questions to find out how that contractor is going to um, respond. So. A good example might be, um, am I going to need a permit for what we're doing? What types of permits are we going to need? Or how are you gonna, how would you handle this situation or how are you going to accomplish, the, accomplish this part of the project? So you're waiting to see if that contractor is, um, you know, deflecting or, or if they're, you know, stumbling or they just don't really have confidence in how they're answering that question. Um, it's gonna be some key indications as to whether or not you're gonna to wanna to work with that contractor. And then um, in all of that, whether you're at the coffee shop or you're on a potential project, just wanna see how that person is communicating and how they're communicating with you. Are they, are they approachable and friendly and, and are you, do you see yourself working with this person for the next month or two months, depending on the size of the project? And uh, do they have a personality that, that you can jive with? Uh, because that's going to be really important. This is going to be the contractor that's, you know, maybe not even going to be the one that's going to be just working on that project, but in future projects. And so what's that relationship going to be like? So just pay close attention to, you know, what that person's personality is like. And does that, does that jive with your own? Once you're done that and you've gone through all of that, this is the part where, where people just kind of slowly taper off and, and maybe they don't do their due diligence. But it's really important that you investigate, investigate, investigate the contractor and everything that they've told you. So I threw in a really cool computer there. That's, the, I think, the first computer that I uh, started on when I was doing my graphic design diploma. Uh, I think that's an Apple II. Uh, 
And uh, if you still use a rotary phone, I, I don't know how uh, that's possible in today's age, but uh, <laughs> good on you. Uh, but do your investigation. So that's making phone calls and, uh, and looking them up online. Um, so you're going to be calling uh, former clients. And you're going to ask some quick questions. I would probably thank that person for just taking the time to uh, 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 quickly answer some questions with you. Um, and uh, you just want to find out how, what was the communication like with, um, with the contractor while they were working with him? Did, did he give them regular updates? You know, typically I'm, I'm updating my clients every day, every second day, uh, depending on, you know, how quickly things are progressing or what happened on the job site. Even if it's just, um, you know, hey, Tony, uh, had a great day today. Uh, you know, this is what we got accomplished. Um, fire off some, some photos via text. But I'm staying in constant contact with my clients so they understand what's going on. And you want to hear that from the former uh, uh, client as well, that that contractor had good communication. They didn't just start the job and then they never heard from the guy for like a week or two and they didn't know what was going on at the house and, and, and they had to actually phone him to find out how things were going or her. Um, and then you want to find out if the project was on time and on budget. Uh, this is particularly important uh, for real estate investors uh, for, for two reasons. You've, you've already forecasted if your project's uh, going to uh, um, cash flow, um, and it's going to be based on what you budgeted the project to be, or you've based whether you're going to profit on that project um, based on the budget. You start uh, finding out from the former client that, yeah, things were over budget and, and it took longer um, than... Uh, then that's not good because if it's going to take your contractor longer than what he said it was going to take, uh, then um, and you're doing a burr uh, strategy, uh, you're hoping that that renovation is going to be done by the end of June because you've got a client lined up for July. So you don't want to uh, all of a sudden have your contractor on on June fifteenth telling you, you know what, uh, you know I know I told you I'd be done by the end of June, but man, we're weeks behind. I'm not going to be ready for July 1st. And, and then what happens? So you just want to hear that, you know, the contractor was, uh, was on time and on budget. It's really important. And uh, it's not whether uh, there was a problem that occurred. And so you want to, you want to, um, whether there was a, a, an issue on a job site or not, it's not really as important as how did that contractor um, handle the problem when it arose. So you wanna just ask that former client, um, when, something, when something went off the rails a little, uh, how did the contractor handle it? Did they contact you and say, hey, this is what's happening on the job site, uh, uh, it's an issue, but I understand um, how, to, how, to, uh, how to fix it, and it's, it's not going to affect our timeline because I'm going to bring an extra guy in or we're going to stay later or what, how did that contractor actually handle that situation? Or did he just leave the person out of it and, and, and his client out of it, kind of brush the problem under the rug? Um, and, uh, and then last, you want to ask them, how do they, uh, how do they keep the, the job site? This is, you know, it's important for, for several reasons. One, um, you want to make sure that uh, you know they're keeping a clean and safe job site for their employees, for their sub trades, uh, but also for you. You're going to want to check in on this job site and see how things are going. And you're going to see the progress. You're you're excited to 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 see how it's moving along, and you want to know that you're going to be you're going to be able to go in on the job site and you're going to be safe. And and so you know how do they how do they keep the job site as well? So. After you uh, have done that, uh, those follow-up calls with uh, former clients, um, you're going to want to do uh, some other due diligence, and uh, and that is uh, you want to ask uh, your contractor for the uh, WCB clearance letter and uh, a liability of, or insur a liability insurance certificate. So those two things are important. Uh, know that the contractor has told you that he has it, uh, and. Um, sometimes, you know, you might feel like you're insulting that contractor or that he might feel like, why are you, why don't you believe me? But um, 
it's still important to do it. You want to get the WCB clearance letter. You want to make sure that uh, that they do have that. It's it's it is really important. And same with the liability certificate. And it's super easy. In fact, you can even get a WCB clearance letter yourself by contacting WCB and and tell them who you're who they who you're working with, and and they'll actually give you that. But you could just let the contractor do that work. He'll send you that and. Uh, um, it's something that I do for clients as well. Uh, and same with the liability certificate. In fact, insurance companies will even, will even um, um, title it to you. So the contractor will call their insurance company and say, I need a, a liability certificate. And the insurance company will say, you know, who am I sending it to? Who am I addressing it to? And the insurance company will send it uh, directly to you, to your email address. Um, you can also check with the municipality to ensure that they have a, um, a license to work there, a business license to work there. Uh, so you can check with them on that, or the contractor can just take a photo of their, uh, um, their law business license and, and email that to you or text it to you. Um, and then last, uh, you, you should just really check in on them on their socials. So uh, visit their Facebook page, visit their in, uh, Instagram page, and uh, and uh, check out their website. See what they're up to. See what type of work. How active is this contractor? Um, you know, are they busy? Are they interacting with their clients and their community? So um, after you've done that, uh, you have. Uh, you now have an opportunity to uh, make a decision uh, if you haven't already uh, on who you're going to work with. Um, and you may be uh, uh, interested in working with uh, multiple contractors. Uh, sometimes it's good to have a few contractors. Maybe you might have a one go to uh, contractor, but you might want to have a couple of other contractors in your back pocket because you might make a last minute decision to purchase a property when you've got a good opportunity that crosses your desk. And, uh, that contractor, your main go-to contractor, uh, he might not be available on your schedule. Uh, so it'd be really good to have another one that you can call uh, in that kind of situation. So it would be good to have a couple of other uh, go-to guys. I have a, you know, a few go-to uh, uh, electricians and plumbers. I have my main guys, but then I always have somebody else that I can call on in, in, the, in the case of an emergency and I, uh, not my main guy isn't available. So uh, you're going to um, pick a contractor to work with and, uh, and you're going to get started on, on the project and, uh, or you're going to invite multiple contractors uh, to um, place bids on the project that you have in mind. And, uh, and uh, it's going to be important to uh, not let uh, price be your only guide. Uh, you're going to want to pick a contractor, uh, not just on price, but also on, uh, on uh, how you how you connect and communicate with that contractor so if you want to um, if you want to get bids from contractors uh, from multiple contractors uh, and you want those bids to be accurate and your decision is going to be based not just on price but price is important um, then uh, that contractor is going to be able to give you the most accurate price if you have a detailed plan. So, um, for example, uh, if you are interested in doing a, a fix and flip, but um, you're not too sure what type of flooring you want to put in, and you don't know what the kitchen's going to look like, uh, and you don't know if you're going to knock down a wall or maybe keep the wall, uh, it's going to be really difficult to get accurate pricing from any one of those contractors. Uh, and they're all gonna be putting in a bid that it's gonna be really loose and it's gonna be difficult to determine um, which contractor uh, has uh, the best value because um, they're gonna be guessing on a lot of things and they're gonna be picking maybe uh, entry level flooring or they might be picking middle of the road flooring. Uh, um, same with the kitchen and so, uh, the more details you have with uh, your plan, uh, the better estimate you're going to get from the contractors that you're looking to get bids from. Uh, and then it is important to have a budget in mind and tell your contractor what your budget is. I know sometimes it's, it's, uh, 
it goes against some strategy where you kind of want to keep your cards close and you don't want to tell like the contractor how much money you're willing to spend. But it is important for the contractor to know, you know, what are, what are the limits here? What am I dealing with? Uh, so that he's not going to come to you. Let's say your, bu your budget is $50,000 for the project. And he's going to come to you with uh, an estimate that's $70,000 because you said, well, I don't really know what my budget is. Uh, and so um, then you're, he's going to come to you with a price of $70,000. And then uh, uh, you're going to say, yeah, you know what? I'm, when I, I was thinking about spending less, uh, may, may, maybe we can save some money here and there. And he could have done that from the very beginning. If he knew that you were going to spend $50,000, he'll take that $50,000 and spread it out amongst the project in the things that uh, you wanted to do. And even better, you may have an I, you may have a, um, a list of priorities of the things that uh, are most important and then if there's money left in the budget we'd also like to do these things um, and really you know talk to your uh, your contractor about um, um, giving you some advice about what would what he would do or what would be that especially if that person is uh, uh, familiar with working with real estate investors or is one himself he's he can give you some advice about how he would approach certain um, things in the uh, renovation and uh, and then tailor his uh, his quote or his estimate uh, around that um, and uh, and then yes uh, don't let uh, don't let price be your guide uh, if you're going to get a contract and you're going to pick the lowest uh, the lowest price um, you may not get the uh, the best contractor for the job and uh, and then they're putting in um, uh, cheap materials and doing a quick job and uh, you're then going in after two years and fixing stuff replacing faucets and uh, ripping out floor because he put in the cheapest laminate etc Okay, so once, uh, once you've selected the contractor, you've picked the bid that you like the best and the contractor that you like the best, uh, you, wanna put, uh, you wanna put this uh, project in writing. And uh, typically the contractor is going to be the one to uh, supply the contract agreement. The contract agreement uh, protects both you and the contractor. And uh, the contract uh, is going to include um, uh, the total cost of the project, um, what the payment schedule is going to be like. So like I said before, uh, if you're working in a, uh, whether it's a cost plus or a quoted project, it's going to be paid out on milestones. And so those milestones are going to be described in the payment schedule. So for example, framing is complete, you're going to issue a check that's say 25% of the total cost of the project, drywall's complete, uh, another 25%. And maybe there's gonna be other things that will be completed um, as well, but at the stage of when drywall is complete, you're, you're gonna issue uh, another check and that uh, contractor is going to uh, send you an invoice saying, uh, milestone to uh, complete, uh, drywall is uh, uh, done, and here, this is the invoice amount. So it's going to outline that, outline that in, the, uh, in the contract agreement. Uh, and then um, it should have start and completion dates. Uh, you want to make sure that that's not just uh, a, a word of mouth thing. You said you were going to start at this time and you said you were going to finish at this time. Uh, you want to make sure that that's uh, 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 down in writing. It's also going to describe dispute resolution terms. So something does go sideways. Uh, this is how we're going to solve it. Uh, and that's going to be laid out uh, in that section of the contract. Uh, it's going to uh, list the details of the project. So you want to make sure that uh, um, in the contract, as much detail about what's going to be done uh, is listed in it. Uh, either actually in the contract or an addendum or attachment to that contract about what they're going to be doing. Because you don't want to get into an argument with your contractor about you said you were going to do this, but you didn't do it. And all it was was just a con uh, con uh, conversation that maybe you or maybe you don't remember what happened. So if it isn't in the contract, he may not do it or she may not do it. So try to get as much detail as far as what's going to be done on the project in the in the contract agreement. Um, they're going to uh, you're going to want the contractor to list the permits that they're going to be getting. 
And in that contract, it should also say that they're going to send you the permits when they get them. And that they're also going to um, send you confirmation that those inspections have been completed. Because the municipality doesn't always send the homeowner uh, the inspection report. So they might send it to the contractor, it might not go to the homeowner. You don't even know if the, he might have got a permit but then never had it inspected. So you wanna know that those permits um, um, are getting inspected. So whether it's the electrical permit, building permit, plumbing permit, uh, all that's been completed. Um, and then it's also gonna be listing the sub-trades that he's gonna be working with. So, um, you know, he's gonna bring in an electrician, he's gonna bring in a plumber, which plumber? What's the name of the company? Um, who are they working with? You want to have uh, you want to have that that information at hand, um, and 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 that's if again if if things go sideways in the project, you want to know which subtrades were working at your house. What were their names? And and, and how do I get a hold of these people? Um, and then what's the standard of work uh, going to be done? You know. Uh, you want, to, um, you want the contract to say that they're going to be working um, under these rules and regulations. Uh, we're going to be working to code according to Alberta uh, um, code standards, and uh, we're going to be using new materials and, um, and so on. And then what, what's the warranty um, for the, the project? So uh, do they have a one-year warranty based on craftsmanship? Uh, it, and uh, you know, is it a staged warranty? So certain things are warrantied longer than others potentially. So you want to have the warranty listed out in that contract agreement as well. And uh, and then they also, I know that you've got the uh, confirmation from the client that uh, they have a liability insurance. You have their liability insurance certificate. Uh, you also want them to have a commitment within the contract agreement that they have uh, insurance coverage that should be listed in the contract agreement as well. Uh, and, uh, and then last but not least, it's gonna also show uh, uh, change order terms. So during the project, if something comes up um, that was unforeseen and, uh, um, you need to add to the project or you've decided that you want to make a change to your project uh, you want to get that change in writing and the contractor wants to get that change in writing that that change order and how that goes about should be listed uh, in the uh, contract agreement so it's going to state this is the work that we're going to be doing um, this is how much it's going to cost and and this is the process and then you're going to sign off on that change order and then they're going to add that cost to the total cost of the project but um, you're going to want to remember that the four most expensive words in the English language are while you're at it so try your best to be as detailed as you possibly can uh, that is uh, um, from the very beginning be as detailed as you possibly can because it's going to be those change orders that are just going to really kill your project along the way if you think you're going to start to um, make selections or we'll worry about it later when we get to that point of the project we'll figure it out then um, you're making mistakes try to prepare as much as you possibly can and and really lean on your contractor to to make those uh, to help you along with it so, you know, at uh, Final Cut, we work closely with our clients to, um, and we want you to be as detailed as you possibly can at the very beginning too. So ask your contractor, is there anything else that we're missing? Um, uh, could you send me a list of the uh, selections that I need to make so that I, I can go out and find those things? Or maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you want your, your contractor to make those selections. I, I couldn't be bothered. I don't care what that faucet looks like. Just make it work within our budget. So just really lean on your contractor to, to be as detailed as, as uh, he possibly can, or she, uh, possibly can be at the very beginning. Michael, if, if I could just jump in for two seconds, I think it's really important for anybody that's taking on a project to have a contingency fund within their budget. A number, whether it be 1% of your total value of your, your project, 5% or 10%, you've got to have some contingency, some backup for those little changes that come along um, on, on projects. And they do happen. It is the nature of construction. There is always something. You open up a wall, Hey, this is going to be an extra couple hundred dollars or an extra or an extra thousand dollars. It's it's just the nature of it. So always uh, carry a, a contingency fund. 
and be uh, expecting to have to expend it. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, so when I do a quoted project for a client, I have my own contingency fund and that contingency is for me. Um, that's for me, you know, uh, underestimating how long um, something is going to take to install or I, I don't count every uh, nut and bolt that goes into a project. So that's my own uh, internal contingency that I use. Um, and if I go beyond that um, and I've quoted that and guaranteed that project and we haven't gone beyond the scope, um, then then that's on me. Uh, then that comes out of my bottom line. Uh, but if something comes along that was uh, unforeseen or wasn't a part of the scope of the project, uh, now that's something that the client is going to be paying for. And so I'm going to give my quoted price of uh, $50,000. Um, you know, I recommend doing at least 10%. Tim says that, uh, you know, he uses 15%. That's great. That's even better. And you're right, don't plan on, you know, oh, let's hope that we don't have to go into contingency. If your project isn't going to be successful, if it is going to cash flow, if you're not going to profit, uh, if you spend that 10 or 15% contingency, then that's not the right property. So thanks, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Thanks, uh, see you for uh, inviting me and uh, um, if you guys have any uh, further questions, you can type it in the chat or if, uh, uh, if you'd like to reach out, here's my contact information. Please feel free to uh, give me a call or um, send me an email and uh, uh, check out our work at uh, finalcutcreations.com. Um, you, know, you can also uh, see what we're up to on uh, Facebook and Instagram. And uh, yeah, look hearing, I look forward to hearing you guys from you guys. Thank you, Michael. And actually, Tim had another question here. Uh, how do you deal with scope creep? Scope creep. So if I understand the question correctly, meaning um, we, we, we set a detailed plan um, and, and we um, picked fixtures and we picked, but then along the way, we just start making changes. Um, I, I imagine that was what he means by scope creep. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I find that happens more in personal projects than in real estate investments. Um, but, uh, uh, sorry, I just see Amanda's question here. If I have uh, a license to work in, in Airdrie. Um, so I haven't ever done a project in Airdrie. I have in Balzac, which is outside. So I don't have a license to work in Airdrie, but uh, I can easily get a license to work in Airdrie. That's not a problem. That's just me contacting the town. And if I, uh, different municipalities will, um, will even have short-term licenses. So I don't have to get a license for a year necessarily. If the project's gonna be a month, I can get a license for a month. Um, but uh, I don't get a lot of requests for projects in Calgary. I mean, sorry, in uh, Airdrie. So I don't maintain a license uh, in, in areas where I don't get a lot of work, but uh, we can just get short-term licenses. Uh, but back to um, uh, scope creep, I'm not too sure if I'm answering the question properly, but I find that happens more in personal projects, so you're someone's own home uh, than, uh, than in, in, a, in, a, in an investment property. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, seem to be something that I try to, to deal with then. Oh, that's what I meant. Some changes, something. Yeah. And Tim, uh, I yeah, no change you change order to process. Ask. So yeah, scope creep is things are getting added to the project. Um, uh, the more we add, because you know we're, uh, as Tim says, creeping on the scope. Um, uh, it just means lots of documentation. So you know we start upgrading um, fixtures and, and making changes, and and now the the cost of the project is increasing. Uh, just lots of documentation. So uh, that's just a matter of. Uh, um, you know, coming back to the office and uh, doing quick estimate about what that change is going to be and then firing that off to a client and them signing off on it. Perfect. Anyone else have any other questions for Michael here? I've got a hey. question, Michael. Just to yeah, sure. yeah, so um, you specialize in basement suite renovations? That's right. So how have you found the city of Calgary of late? 
Yeah, well, I mean, that's a, that's a hot topic. Uh, well, I mean, I guess it's more uh, uh, staying consistent, maybe simmering now. But, uh, you know, in, in, say, in the last year, it's been a hot topic because uh, uh, the city of Calgary, um, they have uh, recently extended the basement suite legalization. So if you have a property that has an illegal suite in it, uh, it was that they were going to uh, have a, you know, for lack of a better term, but a, a forgiveness for um, having the illegal suite and, and relaxing on some of the code requirements for uh, what a suited property should have. They were just falling back on um, the fire code. So that was all you had to do was pass fire code, really. And uh, uh, the 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 actual code requirement for suited properties is much more than, than what's uh, uh, in, in entailed in the, in the fire code, but they, they were trying to really bring um, uh, homeowners and real estate investors that had suited properties or illegal suited properties, um, you know, out uh, from that and into uh, the, the legal side. And that's primarily for, for public safety. And so, Right now, they are very interested in helping homeowners um, and and uh, rental housing providers get those suites on board and and legal, uh, so that uh, tenants are are safe. Because um, unfortunately, there have been some tragic accidents in basement suites, and so they want that to be safe. And uh, then moving forward, uh, I think the code requirements are pretty straightforward. So, and and the, as time goes on, the town is allowing more and more suited property uh, in in more areas of the city and and in more situations. So, uh, it's opening up a lot more. I know Edmonton was uh, a lot uh, further ahead than than Calgary was, uh, or is, uh, but it's getting a lot better. And 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 uh, the inspectors as well. I feel like they're they're, they're a lot easier to, to work with than they have been in the past. I mean, it does depend on which inspector you get, but uh, but for the most part, yeah. I mean, they're they're they want uh, they want things to um, to be safe for the main main part. So they they want to work with contractors and and uh, rental housing providers to 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 get it built properly. Yeah, it sounds like everybody's making a collective effort to uh, work well together. So that's positive. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple questions here from Sam. Yeah, I see Tim. that. So I would say we're doing, um, yes, uh, send it to December 31st. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would say that we're doing, um, Sorry, we're before, getting inquiries to, before you go, the question was, um, have you done more of the, um, legal, the new legal suites or those with already suites in their homes? Yeah, that's what I was just going to address. So, yeah, uh, we're, getting a, we're getting requests from, from current basement suite or suited owners to, uh, to legalize. Uh, so that's just kind of uh, coming online right now. A lot of owners have uh, left it to kind of last minute. So there's a rush now to uh, fit it in. And the primary reason for a lot of that is that uh, um, currently the town of Calgary is not uh, making it mandatory to have uh, independent heat source. Um, and that is actually a code requirement. So typically you would have to put either a second furnace in uh, or some other type of heat source that isn't uh, controlled by the main floor or supplying the main floor at all. Uh, they're not doing that right now. So, but that's only for existing um, suited property. If you are purchasing a property that doesn't currently have a, a a secondary suite in it and you want to put one in you have to meet the current code requirements so you would have to put a secondary heat source of some sort um, whether that's a, a forced air furnace uh, or a, a, a baseboard heat um, or some sort of uh, in-floor heat um, and then um, a fresh air supply so that's a, an HRV um, that would be exhausting to the outside as well so um, I would say that up until now we've been doing more new suites than um, bringing 
older suites up to code, but I think that's going to be that's going to be changing in the next uh, six months. I see ourselves uh, doing a lot of uh, um, bringing illegal suites up to the legal side in the next six months. Of course, um, sorry. Yes, inspector relationships are so important. And uh, the great thing is, is that uh, um, the inspectors uh, tend to stick around different neighborhoods. So I, I see the same guys uh, in the same neighborhoods. So those relationships are great. And, and I definitely get a, a, a great response uh, when I see uh, inspectors come on onto projects that I've seen in the past. And uh, uh, they're, they're a lot more willing to, to work with me and, and so, yeah, those relationships are great. That was an answer to a, a question. <laughs> I'm just trying to read some of these at the same time to see if I can uh, answer any questions. I think the one about the parking spots is probably uh, maybe a good one to, to yeah. talk about. Yeah. So, so yeah, there, there's some unknowns around parking spots and how many parking spots you uh, you have to have um, for a property. And uh, so, because it, I think at one point it, they were they were uh, saying that you needed two for the primary residence and one for the suite. Uh, but uh, I think they've changed that now to two two spots. So. Um, I've been seeing a lot of uh, people doing the um, semi-detached uh, with uh, two spots in the back or a double car garage, double car semi-detached garage, and they're owning both sides. I think that's the sweet spot in in uh, suited property and, and, and definitely looking for a cash flowing property. If you've got the capital to do it and you can buy both sides, you've got a fourplex and uh, uh, you'd be getting some great cash flow. And Michael, so in terms of developing uh, between a detached and semi-detached, is there a difference in the legal requirements for a basement suite? Nope, not at all. Okay. Nope, same, same requirements. Um, and, and, and requirements are dependent on the municipality too. So uh, there are, there are uh, Alberta code requirements, but certain requirements are, are bylaws. And, and so those are governed by the municipality you work in. So, so for example, he, where I live in Cochrane, uh, um, a, a single family detached suited property has to have two uh, parking spots for the primary residence and uh, one parking spot for every uh, bedroom that's in the suited property. So if it was a two bedroom suited property, we would have to have uh, four parking spots and they have to be off street on the property that the suite is in. Where in Calgary, that's not, that's not the case. Okay, so street parking is allowed. Okay. Street parking is not allowed. Oh, it's not allowed, okay. You can't consider street parking as a parking spot. Okay. It has to be off street. So it does, things, it does make things a little bit more difficult there then, especially on the it newer- does. Not all properties are suited for that. So you mm -hmm. definitely wanna um, do your investigations make sure that the property is going to like before you purchase it you make the decision to buy it uh, and it's going to cash flow uh only with a with a, a suite in the basement uh, you better make sure you uh, meet the parking requirements that's that's like the first almost the first step that i look for in a property is is it going to meet the parking requirement and then um you know if you're going to put a garage in the back say for example in in cochran um, you put a garage in the back, it's gonna make it difficult to have that three parking spot depending on the width of the property. So um, it's really all about the width of the property and there's a minimum requirement for uh, uh, the width of a parking stall. Uh, typically you're looking for um, nine feet. And now that really depends on where the parking stall is. So if it's uh, barrier free on both sides, the parking stall can be narrower. But if there's a barrier on one side, the parking stall has to be wider. So whether that barrier is a garage wall or it's a fence or a retaining wall of some sort, uh, if there's a wall on one side or both sides of the parking stall, it has to be wider than if there's no barrier at all. Sure. And, that's, and that's in most municipalities. Perfect. Anyone else? 
Yes, in Cochrane, it makes it difficult to have the three spots. That's why you're probably not going to find a whole lot of legal. I'm just I'm, I'm commenting on Amanda's uh, comment here and saying that the parking uh, requirement is insane. Yeah, um, yeah. If it, you're probably not going to find a lot of legal. Uh, uh, two bedroom suites in Cochrane because you'd have to have four spots that are off street. Uh, so, uh, you know, for myself, we have uh, a couple of suited properties. And so we have, uh, so on front drive, it's possible, but if you are on a lane property, it's a lot harder to get the foreigners four stalls. So on a front drive property, interestingly enough, now it depends on where you are in Calgary. You can't do this. They don't allow tandem parking as a, as a qualification, but in Cochrane, you can, so it's tricky. If you've got a front, if you've got a front drive property, uh, so a front attached garage, um, they actually consider the uh, two spots in the garage and then also two spots on the um, driveway leading up to the garage. So there's your four spots if you want to have a two bedroom in Cochrane. Um, uh, to qualify those four spots you can do tandem parking now in the city of calgary they don't allow that you can't do tandem they won't qualify that they have to each be an independent spot but you only need two <laughs> be careful with your garages there are a few that don't meet parking requirements yeah okay i was just reading sandy's uh, comment here so yeah yeah, you have to be, uh, the, the garage qualification is a little bit tricky. There's there's some details in there that you have to pay attention to, but yeah. Thank you for listening to the Commonwealth Home Ownership Podcast. Be sure to check out all of our past episodes and our ever-growing library of content at cwho.ca. Until next time, remember to get out there, take action, and create a life of wealth by design.